we still covet your prayers for health conditions with Mike. Um, this morning, my reflection is going to be, um, how do we approach our um, prayer time? How do we approach God when we come to study, to um, study our lesson, our Sunday school lesson, our discipleship training, just our devotions? Do we believe that God is true? Do we believe his word and trust him? We all have a past and we all have some baggage that goes along with it. We cannot let that affect the way that we study. We can't let that affect the way that we trust God. Do we pray before we study or take our time out with God? Prayer matters. No matter if we have to repeat it and repeat it, our hearts need it. It is a reminder for us to ask God to direct us. Do we expect things when we pray? We need to expect it. God expects us to expect it. He expects us to show up. <laughs> we expect God to show up when we study in his word, and he will. It may not be right then and there. He hears us, so we need to pray. He is alive and his word lives in us. No matter how many times we have to read the verse, study the verse, or study the scripture, when we pray, we are to expect things from him, and it isn't his time. If there's sin, expect con conviction. If there's guilt, expect forgiveness. If there's weariness, expect strength. If there's fear, expect courage. If there's sorrow, expect comfort. If there's confusion, expect direction. There's many more that we could go on through, and you have your own. That was just some of the ones that come to my mind this morning or yesterday, last night. But um, let's just thank God to move and do things when we ask him to. When we study, let's make sure he's our first and foremost, um, has our attention, full and foremost. And just ask him to help us to do what's right and, and live for him the way that he wants us to. And we also covet each and other each other's prayers so we pray one for another um, no matter what's going on in, in our lives but if you will um, reflect on that this week and maybe it'll make a difference in how you study your um, lesson or your um, Bible study this week we're going to stand and we're going to sing praise um, the name of Jesus <laughs>
Well, good morning. So glad you're here and worshiping with us this morning. We look forward to uh, just a good, a good morning and, and uh, of praising the Lord and what and for what He's done. Uh, we've had a, a good week, and I just want to point out some things that are going to be happening. We have lots of issues, uh, things going on that that are in uh, the bulletin. You can read that. But I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, we have uh, our committee meeting night. This is what we're going to do, call it our committee night. Uh, so uh, what, when we normally have church training and worship service, we're going to meet with our committees. We have a lot of people who are in the committees. Uh, if you don't know, uh, we do have lists, uh, but I think everyone knows which committees you're on. But uh, in the back, if you look in the, the insert of your bulletin, uh, there is a little committee meeting night uh, uh, this is this will be the schedule. We're going to start tonight with the business meeting at 5:30. So we'll we'll be doing our business meeting at 5:30. Then we're going to break off from that, and we're going to meet on our different committees. And uh, you can see it. Uh, uh, children's Bible drill will still happen tonight. Now we need Alicia in here for our business meeting. So so Beth's going to do the Bible drill for the first 20 minutes, and then uh, she'll swap out with uh, Alicia for the next uh, section. So. Uh, we so kids are welcome to come. They'll be doing the Bible drill back uh, in in the Sunday school room back here. Now, the, uh, so we'll start here in the sanctuary with our business meeting, and then Billy and Grants are going to go to the fellowship hall. I mean, worship and music team will be right here, uh, and our benevolence meeting will be in the youth Sunday school room. And so I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And uh, but we, if you're a part of those committee, we really do need you here, uh, so we can make sure uh, to plan for uh, our church and the things that we're going to be doing in our church. The second thing that's happening, and I noticed, I know that you've seen these in the back. I've got a, a new thing. We're we're doing a, a Vidalia Onion fundraiser, okay? And so this is the sheet that you're going to fill out. Uh, so we're asking that people take these home and, and neighbors. Uh, people you work with, uh, other people that are interested in buying uh, a bag of Vidalia onions. Now they're really good. Um, if you like onions, uh, these are the best, and um, and they're ten dollars a bag. That's what we're going to sell them for. So if you sign them up, we also have these little sheets, and it'll tell you uh, so you can give to the people so they know when to get their onions. Okay. And the plan is, if everything goes as goes right, if they grow right. If they're ready to go, uh, and, and they're supposed to be, is we will hand them out on April 29th right here in the church, okay? And if you are, are selling your items, but you can't get them on April 29th, we'll work something out with you. Just let us know. But uh, but as far as uh, uh, getting them, they'll be done on April 29th. And so we have these little flyers you can give to the people. So they put them on the refrigerator or whatever they want so they know when to get their onions, okay? Uh, if you have any questions about that, just ask me. Uh, we have a missions tea for Annie Armstrong coming March 12th. Uh, this was something that started last year and it was very successful raising money for Annie Armstrong. I don't think, know if you've noticed, but we have our Annie Armstrong posters up. Our goal this year is the $1,100 uh, to raise money for missions. And, and I'm sure we'll be able to reach that goal uh, very easily in this church. And so I'm excited about that. Uh, we do have... Uh, other things coming up, uh, Missions Extravaganza on March 25th. This is for the kids. Uh, we're going to be meeting here, I think, about uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to be going to uh, Hazel uh, Creek Baptist Church and, and learning about missions and the things that you can do uh, to support missions. It's such a, a, big, uh, a big part of who we are as Baptists. And, uh, and as we share God's love around the world. Is there anything I need to mention that's not been mentioned? Okay. Well, let's continue with our worship. We're going to stand as we greet one another. <laughs>
We'll take you worship him. Turn to page 148. Page 148. We'll sing all five verses. You would please stand while we sing. all three verses. Oh. 
Harris, come forward, please. Let's have our children come forward. All right. We have a good group. All right. Is everybody having a good week of school? Do you guys get tomorrow off? Is tomorrow the day off? Oh, okay. Well, that's good. So you get to have a... Uh, a day to have fun. So uh, that should be good. So I hope uh, that everyone's having a good week. But we want to talk about love, okay? Now, now, one day, someone asked Jesus, they said, well, what is the greatest commandment? And he said two things. He said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he said the second part, he said this, and this is the verse he gave. He said, love your neighbor as yourself, okay? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's your neighbor? The guy, the people that live right next to you, next door? Okay, that's usually what we think of a neighbor, the person who's lived right next door to us. But Jesus had a little bit more in mind than that. He said, he gave this story, and he said that there was a man traveling. He was going on the road to Jericho. Okay, so as he's going on this road, some bandits came up and they, they beat him up and they stole all his money and everything he had and they left him on the side of the road to die. And uh, that's not very nice, is it? Okay, well, uh, so he's lying on the side of the road. He needs some help. He needs someone to come by and help him. And there was a person that came by, he walked by, saw him and he said, oh, I don't have time to help. And he went on the other side. <laughs> And then the second person comes by and says uh, that, that that he wasn't in, able to help him, so he went to the other side. Then a third man, a man who was from Samaria, they call him the Samaritan, and he uh, he went there and he saw the man, and he took him and put him on his donkey, brought him into town, 
and put them up in, they didn't have hospitals, so he put them up in a hotel room. They washed them, he cleaned them, and he took care of them and made sure that everything he needed was taken care of. Now he says, Jesus says, but who was the neighbor? The neighbor was the third man who, who helped someone who was in need. So a neighbor could be anyone who has a need, and we need to help them. So when we think about who our neighbor is, don't just think about the people living next door, but it could be anyone that God brings into your path that you need to help. That's your neighbor, okay? So we should love our neighbor as ourselves. So let's all let's say that together. Love your neighbor as yourself. Luke 2, 10, 27. Luke 10, 27. I did say it right. Okay, uh, so let's do that again. Love your neighbor as yourself. Luke 10, 27. Very good. Let's have, go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for this chance to be in your house. I thank you, Lord, that, that uh, uh, you've given us neighbors that we need to help and take care of. And Lord, I just pray that, that we would use the example of this Samaritan uh, in our lives. Uh, as we come across people who are in need. And Lord, I just also ask that you just watch over us now as we go through the rest of this service. And I ask this in Christ's name, amen. All right, you may be seated. But uh, you've enjoyed, we've been studying Romans chapter 8 for the last oh, four weeks. And I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And we're going to go over, today is our, going to be our last message from this. And it's a good, good closing uh, part of that. So we're going to be reading Romans 8 verses 31 to 39 today. So if you can turn your Bibles to Romans 8, 31 39. Let's, let's uh, read this and uh, tell me you don't get excited about hearing these verses. These uh, We've had some really good verses and um, and I'm going to go over that in just a second. So let's say this we read Romans 8, uh, 31 to 39. It says this, when then are we to say, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for all of us. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one he, who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Romans 8 has been uh, just a, I, I, I think, you know, that might be my favorite chapter in, in Scripture. I, I have lots of favorites. But Romans 8, as we've learned about a lot of things. Let's just think about some of the verses that we've covered in Romans 8. Verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. A verse that talks about that, that Jesus paid it all. We are no longer condemned. Our sins have been taken away. Romans 8.15 You have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Uh, another great verse that talks about how the, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us and lives in us and helps us to learn more about who God is and we are no longer 
uh, just members of God's community. We are children of God. We are adopted children of God. He is taking us into his homes, and we don't call him God. We can call him Father. We can call him Daddy. Romans 8, 16 and 17, we are God's children, and if children, also heirs. We are heirs to whatever God has, heirs to everything. <laughs> Fellow heirs with Christ, able to be a part of God's kingdom as his children. Romans 8, 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worth, worth comparing with the glory that is going to be re revealed to us. The sufferings that we have today are meaningless compared to the glory that will be revealed to us one day. Romans 8, 26, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. That through the suffering we have today, the Spirit is going to be with us to get us through it too, so that we can endure, we can persevere through anything. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God who are called according to his purpose. That in the end, God's going to take and put it all together. And even the things and the hard times we have, God's going to put it all together, and he's going to make it good. And the things that God's going to do for us, and we're going to say, this was good that we went through it. What are some statements, what verses that we can have? And he's going to end this chapter by talking about the triumph of the believer. Nothing can separate us from God. And this is a, this is the triumph of the believer. And we're going to look at that today. And the first one I want to look at in this verse is this. It says this in verse 31. If God is for us, who is against us? If God is for us, who is against us? Nothing that can happen to you in life can you work rob you of the reward or the love that God has for you. So the first thing we need to remember is that when we believe in Jesus, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, when we come to him, nothing in this world can separate us from the love that God has for us. That's a wonderful thing to think about. Why? It's because God is stronger than anything else. He is stronger than all of them. Who is going to overrule God? Look what it says in uh, verse 32. He says, uh, For if God is for us, then who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. See, God is stronger than anything that is against us. I remember watching several years ago, uh, a video, and this is, I don't know why this came to me when I read this, but it was a video about something that happened in Africa. This was uh, baby hippos, and they, they, were, they were running around, uh, I guess, some watering hole, and in this watering hole around the baby hippos were all these huge crocodiles, okay? And the baby hippos were just you know, going right between them, uh, kind of running around them, and, and the crocodiles, which were bigger, which were hungry, wouldn't touch them. Wouldn't touch these baby hippos. And we've, when in the, the documentary, that they showed why. And the reason why they wouldn't touch the baby hippos is because Mama Hippo was over there. Okay, and Mama Hippo, she's, I don't know, 6,000, 8,000 pounds, and and if you mess with her baby, she's going to put that full 8,000 pounds onto you. That's what it was. And those crocodiles knew that. They knew if they touched those hippos, then Mama Hippo was going to come in there and take care of them. Okay? I guess hippos are stronger than alligators. They're pretty mean animals, from what I understand. But this is the same thing. When we are in this world... We're like the baby hippos, okay? We are, are, are going through this world, and we're going to run across things that are going to try to take us from the love of God, but they can't because our God is stronger than anything that we can come against. Our God is bigger. He's more powerful. He's able to overtake 
anything that is against us. They can't separate you from God because our God is bigger, stronger, and more powerful. If he did not spare his own son, why would he withhold anything from you? God is not only powerful, but he's giving to you. He wants to give you everything that you need. He wants to take care of you, and he's not going to just take care of you now, but he's going to take care of you more, and in the future, when you get to heaven, he's going to give you the glorification that you desire. If he did not withhold even his own son from you, why would he withhold that from you? He will fulfill his promises to us, and the process of being glorified has begun. The Bible talks about salvation, and there's really three stages to salvation. I've always heard it, is that you were saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved, okay? Uh, in other words, it's you are sanctified, uh, no, you were saved, now you are being sanctified, and you will be glorified. And that's what the whole process of salvation. We were saved in the past. We came to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are currently being sanctified. That's the time that we are living here. And when we get to heaven, we will be glorified with Christ in heaven. That's what it means to be saved. And because of that, we know that if God is for us, there's no one who can take us away from that. God is for us. Who can be against us? The second thing, point I want to make today is this. Who can, he says this in verses 33, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God's elect, that's the people who believe. That's those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Savior. That is God's elect. That's who he's talking about. God himself has justified you. See, God is the highest judge, and he has declared us not guilty. And this is what he said uh, when he says, uh, there's now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He has declared us not guilty. He is the highest judge. If you are on a trial here in the state of Georgia, let's say you have committed a crime, Okay. And you go to the court and you get freed of that crime. You're not determined it's not guilty. You know, what they can do is they can appeal it to the, the higher court. But if they can appeal it all the way to the Georgia Supreme Court, which is the highest court in our state, if you are found not guilty there, then you are not guilty. There's nothing else they can do. Well, in the same way, when you are found not guilty before God, there is nowhere else someone can go. He is the highest judge. The highest court is right there. God himself has justified you. What does it mean to be justified? It means that he has taken your sin and he has separated it from you and cast it as far away as, as the east is from the west. You are no longer guilty. You stand acquitted of whatever you have done. The truth is we are guilty. We have sinned. But God has taken the sin away from us because of what Jesus has done on the cross and he has justified us, meaning that we can stand before him as if we have never sinned. God himself has justified us and there's no greater judge than God. Secondly, Jesus guarantees our justification. Jesus guarantees our justification. Look what it says here in verse 35. Uh, right, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Jesus died, he, he died for our sins, and what he did when he died for our sins is atoned for our sins. He has paid for our sins, he has taken care of our sins, he has made sure that we do not have to pay for our sins anymore, because he paid the price. But his resurrection verified it. 
See, his resurrection is what guarantees it. When we're going to look at the resurrection of Christ here, we're getting ready to go into the Easter season. We have Annie Armstrong coming on. You know it's Easter when Annie Armstrong is coming on. We're getting ready to collect Easter eggs and do things uh, getting ready for Easter. So that's coming. But the most important thing about the Easter season is the resurrection of Christ. The most important thing in the history of Christianity is the resurrection of Christ. If Christ is not raised, then nothing else matters. When Christ was raised from the dead, it guarantees that we are justified. His death paid for our sins. And how do we know that? He was raised from the dead. And the second thing about Christ uh, guaranteeing our justification, look at what it says right here. He is also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. And this is something I, I want us to think about Jesus and who he is and what he does for us is that Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of God. This gives him the same power as God. He is the one sitting there wanting to do what God wants him to do. He is ready to, to, to do whatever is needed. And because he's sitting at the right hand of God, he's got God's ear. And what does he do? He prays for us. That's what he's doing when he's interceding. Jesus is interceding for us and praying for us. And lifting up our names to God. In a sense, Jesus is our lawyer. The book of Hebrews kind of talks about this as Jesus is being our advocate before God. That he is talking to God. He is saying, this person is free. John, he's sitting over here and he's saying, John, he's okay. Because his sins have been paid for, he is free, he is not guilty. He is interceding on our behalf in front of God. And because of that, he is guaranteeing our justification. The third point I want to make today, this is, this is uh, the verses that I think we remember, the ones we're going to read next, is who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Let's read verses 35. He says this. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are putting to death all day long. We are put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. This is what's happening. The afflictions and sufferings that we endure today are not evidence that God has stopped loving us. And he's talking to the, the early church here. And he's talking about people, they're suffering. There's persecution that they have to face. There are, there are things that they face every day, individual uh, things that happen in their lives. And they, and they say, well, if God loved me, why are these bad things happening to me? And Paul is saying right here, he's saying that even the bad things that are happening in your life are not evidence that God has pulled his love from you. He still loves you, even through all of that. You might say to yourself, well, I'm suffering something, maybe a debilitating disease, maybe cancer or, or heart disease or something is in my life. God must not love me. No, God loves you, and he will get you through it. You might say, I'm, I'm financially ruined. I, I have nothing. God must not love me. And the truth is, no, God loves you. He'll get you through it. You say, my kids, they've forsaken everything I've taught them. God must not love me. No, God loves you. He'll get you through it. None of this is evidence that God has departed from you. He still loves you no matter what. Suffering, affliction, persecution, they're a part of life. We are in a world that has fallen. We are in a world that is sin. And we are always going to experience the consequences of the sinful world. And we're going to always have that. But God will still, despite all this, God will still fulfill his purpose in the lives of those who believe in him. He is fulfilling his purpose right now. He is changing you. He is getting you ready to, for heaven so where you will receive 
to the full glorification of what God has for you. You think, well, maybe I've done too many things in life and God doesn't love me because I've done been too bad. Uh, but I've heard this, that there is not a sin, that you cannot sin your way out of God's love. You can't commit too many sins that God's going to say, yeah, he stepped over the line, he's gone. I can't love him anymore. No, God loves you. In the history of the world, there is not a single person who has committed more sins than God is able to love that person. God loves you. He cares for you. He, he died for you because you committed those sins, because he loved you so much. The afflictions and sufferings that we endure today are not evidence that God has stopped loving us. Why? Let's read verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. We are conquerors because he has conquered sin. He has conquered death. That we, and when we believe in him, we get to piggyback on that. We get to receive that same salvation that he's offered us all. We conquer because he has already conquered. God is preparing us for that love. And so he says this, and this is one of those verses that just speaks to us. He says, nothing can separate you from his, from his love. He says this, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing <laughs> will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You may feel unworthy of his love. You say, well, I, I can't receive God's love. I'm not worthy of it. The answer to that is, yes, you are not worthy of it. None of us are worthy of God's love, but he does give it to you anyway. He gives you his love no matter what. And you can't, you can reject it, but you can't, you can't get rid of it. God always loves you. He wants you. He died for you. He cares for you. This is the message uh, in the book of Romans. This is what the message that God is giving us today. God loves you. And so if you don't know anything from today's uh, time in church or today's message, you should know this, that God loves me. God loves me. He loves you so much, I believe that if, if you were the only person on this earth and you had sinned, he'd still send his son to die for you. That's how much he loves you. That's a promise of God. We can't, we can't get away from God's love. He loves you no matter what. Nothing can separate you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your love for what it means to each one of us I know Lord that sometimes I feel so unlovable but I know Lord that you love me anyway and I thank you for that but there's nothing that I, I can do to escape your love so I should just accept it Lord I just pray as we go through this time of decision, of a time of, 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 of getting close to you and, and examining ourselves, I pray, Lord, that there's love will, that your love will just transcend and come into our hearts and our lives and, and help us to know that you're there. We all experience <clears throat> tough times, Lord, and I know there are times in my life where, where I feel alone, but I'm not alone. There are times when I feel uh, rejected, but I'm not rejected. And there are times, Lord, that I feel uh, that, that you have taken your love from me, but you haven't because your love is always there. Well, Lord, I just pray that we would realize that. And if there's anyone today, Lord, that, that uh, needs to make a decision for you, may you draw them to, to yourself. 
and and maybe this church. And Lord, I just ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you uh, need to make a decision for Christ, now is the time to do it. We're going to stand and we're going to sing our closing hymn. And if there's a, if you need to come see me, I'll be right here in the front to receive you. Page 414. <laughs> Said that you said that the sweetness of these. Oh, well, okay. my the sweetness is great. Yeah, I'll buy them all of it, y'all. All right, we're on, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and um, yeah, with our prayer time, uh, let's, we'll hold off on singing today. There's such a little crowd. Um, but uh, it's kind of a dreary day here. In Mount Airy, so hope it's better where you're at. <laughs> but uh, uh, it is going to be not cold, but it is raining. And so, but we're going to look at our prayer list and our missionaries having birthdays today, as well as our other prayer list and pray for our missions. I do want to ask, say, we're going to start doing the Body Moon uh, offering for North American missions. Uh, what is our goal? What was our goal last year? I'm trying to remember. Right at a thousand. Uh, right at a thousand. I think so. Okay, so that's what we'll have as the goal again this year: a thousand dollars to be raised. Or do we want to keep it with the same as the Lottie Moon? Up to you. Okay. Well, if we do the same as Lottie Moon, that's eleven hundred. So I think we can do that. If we can do a thousand, we can do eleven hundred. And so we'll have um, prayer guides and envelopes ready to go. Uh, as we raise money for Annie Armstrong, and uh, they have come in. That's what I brought. Yes, okay. yes, I have them on my desk. I have, I will have them up by Sunday, and uh, ready to go. And uh, Easter is the ninth, I believe, of April, eighth or ninth. Uh, and so, uh, we'll start planning for Easter activities and the things that are happening there. We will have a, a Easter egg hunt, um, and uh, at the courthouse on the first. Yeah, so I would make Easter to be on the ninth. Okay, and so the first is uh, the date we will um, be at the courthouse. Okay. We are going to pray for our missionaries having birthdays today on Wednesday, February 15th. There's DM and DS, JB, DL, EN, JS, JK, MN. I just remind you all these initials are people that are serving in areas that uh, are not open to missionaries. Uh, so they are serving, doing other things. They're not going as missionaries. They might go as a business us, maybe a business worker or, um, or a teacher or that type of thing and serve and, and spread the gospel uh, through uh, that method. And so they definitely need our prayers. Uh, we're in, that's been a concentration on the International Mission Board is to reach people who are in uh, closed countries. And so, um, and so they're very open and they're very successful. As people want to know about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's there too. So uh, that's the exciting thing. Daniel Nice, uh, M I, uh, D A, D M, D S, A D D M H S, S P, Shannon Rogers, Jimmy Boyd, Fan Cobb, Mark Lozuk, uh, Bill McCall, Don McNeil, Courtney Street, Carolyn Tobias, J D Hedeman, Hedema. Michael Redinger, uh, Neil Walker, Dusty Marshall, Luis Gomez, Corey Chaplin, Martha Oaks, Heron Pulnick, and Clint Ashley have all been missionaries uh, serving today. And so uh, we, we want to pray for them. We want to pray for, uh, for, for Chris and Rachel Thomas, 
I continue to lift them up in missions. I continue to lift up the missions activities that we're doing. We're going to have some some good ones coming this next month. Of course, preparing for the Annie Armstrong, uh, as well as the Mission Extravaganza, which will be in March 25th, um, as well as uh, other activities uh, that will be an outreach to the community and, and uh, put us out there so uh, people can see uh, our church and respond to the gospel. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer for missions. And Brenda, can you please lift us up? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come to your house to worship you. And Lord, I want to bring all the missionaries to you today that's having birthdays. May they be feel your protection, feel your power. May they win souls in their work. Give them everything that they need. Be with their families and keep their families safe. Lord, I pray for Rachel and Chris. As they're there in Mexico, living days without water and days without electricity. The Lord, it takes a lot to be willing to be away from your family and to live like that. God, please bless them, take care of them, and give them all their needs. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's look at our prayer list. Is there anything we need to add to that prayer list? Uh, any needs out there? We need to add Charles Crow. Charles is my neighbor. His grandson, Jacob Downer, is a member of the church. Okay. And he came home with hospice this week. Else. Oh, is it Cameron? No. Dalton. Dalton. What's going on with Dalton? He has a hernia. Oh. Okay, we'll pray for Dalton. It happens with babies. Anyone else that we need to remember? Nothing. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Judy, can I get you to bring this up in this prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have poured us each and every day, Father, in your presence. Thank you for your grace and the mercy that you show us each day. Father, we just ask your special blessing upon everyone that's on our prayer list for Charles and his family. We just pray that you would be with them and that you would just comfort them in the days that they're going to be facing here. We ask your special, special blessing upon our little baby Jacob. We just pray that you would just be with him and that you just guide the doctors tomorrow and help him through and have a lot of pain, Lord. Thank you that you're there and that we can call on you in times of need. Lord, we pray for all the other people that's on our prayer list, those that are sick. I pray for those that are having problems within their families. And Lord, there's just so much going on in the world, and you know each and every thing that's going on. We just lift each one up to you. We just pray that you would just be with them. In Jesus' name, I pray. Okay, we're in the book of Ephesians, and uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and if probably this is the 
clear, clearest expression of the gospel, I think, uh, we ever see in, in scripture, I, it, the purpose of it, what, how you, why we need the gospel, why we need what God does. And I, I, I'm just reading through this, and it's such uh, a good statement about what it means to be saved. Why are we needing to be saved? And, and why does the world need to be saved? And uh, it's all right here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So we're going to look at these. We're going to look at them first with verses 1 through 5. And so let's read those verses. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. And so we're going to stop right there. Uh, he begins with this statement that you were dead in trespasses and sins. And uh, if you, the word trespass and sins, they're basically interchangeable. It's often used interchangeably in scripture. Uh, but here he uses it, I think, for emphasis twice. Uh, trespasses actually uh, is, means you're violating, you know, it's like if you, someone trespasses on your property, that means they've come inside your boundaries, okay? without permission and so when we're talking about the trespassing as you're violating the law you're violating the legal you stepped outside of the boundaries of the law that's what it means uh, to trespass is uh, uh, the law is that you you're no longer within it you're no longer operating within the law you're operating outside of it so you are trespassing uh, the law and of course the sin sin literally means missing the mark Okay, you're, it's like uh, someone shooting an arrow. They would have thought about that, of course, at this time because uh, archers were very common. And, uh, and so you have the, the bullseye in the middle and if you miss it, you know, you're off, okay? And you need to fix that. So sinning is missing the mark. And so, and when you say you're dead in trespasses and sins, but when we sin, when we trespass against God, we are dead. We are uh, living uh, separated from God, dead. For we're all dead in sin. And so uh, this is all stated, I think, real clearly here, that, that our sins are what keeps us uh, away from God. Uh, in verse 2, he says, where you previously lived. So you were dead in trespasses. You, this is your life. This is what it was before. You have a changed life. But this is how the world lives. This is how the world is. They're dead in the trespasses and their sins. We don't have to go very far to see that. We were a part of that world. We're no longer a part of it. We're separated from that world. So the world lives in sin. They, they live missing the mark. They live outside of the law. And, uh, and not only is it the world, but Satan is a part of that. And I think when we look at these, this in verse 2, when he says... Uh, the ways of this world according to the ruler of the power of the air the spirit now working in, disobe in the disobedient something that's uh, very clear in scripture uh, that is that there is a realm a spiritual realm that we're a part of we're, there's a physical realm that we live in that we see that we can touch and feel but there's also a spiritual realm that we live in in which our spirits are part of okay and um, and this is where the this is the realm of angels. This is the realm of demons uh, and the realm of Satan as well. And so there is this realm in which uh, Satan lives in the spiritual world. And this is what he's talking about: the power of the spirit of the air, or the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. This is Satan operating freely in that realm, not because. Uh, God isn't there, it's because man has allowed him to be there, okay? Uh, we follow him, we do what he says, 
And so when you live in that realm, you're living in his world and you're operating un under his influence uh, because we have placed him there and we want him there. And that's kind of how, how it operates. We want Satan there. And so, because uh, uh, we think he works for us, okay? <laughs> so when we say all these things and they're sinning, you know, and maybe their success in their sins uh, because Satan is a, a deceiver, right? I mean, he will deceive them into thinking that this is the way to live. And we're not supposed to be following him. Uh, and and so uh, you think about there was that Super Bowl ad, ad. I don't know if anyone saw it, but I did, uh, where it was a Christian ad uh, that was actually you know kind of coming into uh, the world. And uh, Christians liked the ad. It was very good. It was very well done. Uh, but uh, but they, they it faced a lot of criticism. You know, why is this thing coming out here? We don't need to hear this. This is hate. It was there wasn't any hate though, the whole thing about the ad, but they're trying to put this out. And, and this is, of course, Satan. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're doing things of Christ and you don't feel <laughs> the backlash fr from Satan, then you're probably not doing <laughs> enough, right? And so you're going to see this backlash that happens. And this is because of the the satanic or the demonic or the evil influence in the spiritual realm it's out there and it's very real and uh and so uh, so satan is very much a part of that and I, in verse three he says we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires so paul's placing himself with them you know i was in part of this world too and I think this is something that we need to all realize this, even when we're Christians and we've been saved by grace, uh, we were once a part of that world, okay? Uh, if we have sinned one time, we were a part of that world, okay? And we deserve uh, the death and the punishment that happens. We too previously lived there. We can, and this is why uh, we don't judge because we were guilty as well so we don't judge that world instead we try to say hey this is your way out of it and if you're re willing to listen we'll help you okay i understand why you're there i was there too and so it's that's different than judging when you point your finger we're instead giving a helping hand out and so this is uh what we're trying to do it, it in in this as we're saved we too previously lived there. It was our, he says this, he says it was our own inclination, our own, I think we're all inclined to sin. We have an inclination to sin. And uh, you don't think about this, but uh, you know, all of us, you have little ones in your house and stuff. At some point, you know, they're so sweet and cute but they also want to do the wrong thing. They want to be bad, okay, at times. And you're going to see it happen because their inclination is to do the thing. If you say to, uh, maybe not Dalton yet, <laughs> but 